Hi, my name is Ryan Naska, and I'm here to talk about a history of the diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. I wanted to do this presentation due to the recent changes we've seen uh, from the DSM-4TR to the DSM-5. As you can tell, a lot of changes have been made, a lot of things were taken out, a lot of uh, things were added to the new definition of autism spectrum disorder. So I want to go over a brief history of how it went from uh, to what it was classified in the 1900s to uh, what it is now. So what autism is now is currently identified as a pervasive neurodevelopmental disorder defined by impairments within social communication and the presence of repetitive or restrictive behaviors and our interests. This can occur with accompanying intellectual impairments, um, and according to the CDC, uh, approximately 31% of individuals with ASD have an IQ below 70, indicating that a large percentage of individuals with ASD also have an intellectual impairment. However, in, like around 2008, the number of individuals with ASD who also had a, uh, an IQ below 70 was around 80%. So as we can see, there's been a large shift towards identifying individuals with ASD who are considered high functioning. As you can see, the DSM-5 does a pretty good job of um, separating individuals into three different levels of severity that exist on a spectrum. These levels are based on the amount of support that the individual needs, so level 3 being the highest uh, level of support, while level 1 is requiring the least amount of support. The scientific community also um, tends to identify these individuals as being either low or high functioning, depending on their level of IQ and their level of adaptive behavior or, or adaptive functioning. But typical, typically, these individuals with ASD struggle with uh, demands of everyday life and find it more difficult to achieve and maintain friendships, as well as reach higher levels of independence in adulthood. So as you can see, this is just a copy straight from the DSM-5, and what this is, is uh, it's the level, it's the severity level between each one, level 1 being the lowest amount of uh, support needed, and level 3 being the highest amount of support needed for things in the social communication domain and the rep restrictive, repetitive behavior domain, and if, if you want more information on that, you can always just look at DSM-5. So now we're going to get into the history, where it all started, how it went from um, in, how it was defined in the 1900s to how it's defined now. And Eugene Bleuler was the first one to um, kind of like look at individuals with um, these autistic traits. So he was looking at um, schizophrenic uh, patients, and he came he he came up with a subgroup that he that he called. Um, autism, he actually coined the term autism, and these individuals tended to be withdrawn, shut themselves off, and that he considered them self-absorbed, and any influence from the outside world was considered an intolerable uh, disturbance for these individuals. Now, as we know, um, uh, individuals with autism uh, don't have schizophrenia, but uh, he was the Eugene Bleuler was the first person to actually coin the term autism and actually uh, identify these individuals. And then we go on to Leo Kanner and Hans Asperger's in the 40s, who kind of picked up on the work of uh, Bleuler. But they thought they kind of separated um, these individuals with autism from individuals with schizophrenia. They were both born in Austria, and they both. Um, they both uh, identified a list of traits of, for these individuals, and despite the, the two never actually encountering them, Connor's work um, actually uh, get, obtained more popularity than Asperger's work did, mostly because Asperger's work was isolated to Europe. But they both re recognized a select group of individuals with autism who displayed a good level of intellect and communication skills. So they actually found a, a large majority of individuals that, which, we, with, which we consider to have high-functioning autism. So as we can see, Connor uh, identified a list of traits for 11 different children, and he suggested that these children had early infantile autism. And as you can see, the trait list here has a lot of uh, things that you know we commonly recognize with children with autism, such as impairments in social interaction, limitations in spontaneous activity, and also anguish for changes. But he also has a list of some more positive traits, such as good memory and good intellect. Hans Asperger uh, also div also um, came up with a list of traits for these types of children, but he identified them as ha as being autistic psychopaths. The main difference between Asperger's work and Connor's work was that Asperger did not mention ukulele in his description, and Connor did not mention clumsy movements. But their trait list is very similar, most having to do with social interaction and uh, communicating with um, individuals. Uh, so, like Asperger said, they had one one sided conversations, little ability to form relationships, and etc. And around this time, you know, the DSM and the DSM-2 came out and in the 1950s and 1960s, and it kind of ignored Connor and Asperger's work because autism was yet to be defined. The closest thing to actually to, um, 
to defining these individuals with these specific traits was under the diagnosis of schizophrenic reaction, uh, childhood type. So even in the 50s and 60s, it was still considered a subset of schizophrenia. And then we move on to um, Bruno Bettelheim. Um, and in, in the 1960s in general, there were two individuals, Bruno Bettelheim and uh, Bernard Rimland, who really uh, argued about what were the causes of autism. And this is important because it kind of helped with the, cat the current categorization of autism. Bettelheim wrote in his book, The Empty Fortress, that the main uh, cause for autism was environmental is environmental factors, is specifically parenting. He felt that like the reason for this disorder was due to the coldness of mothers, and he called them refrigerator moms. Whereas Bernard Rimlin, he actually had a child with autism, and he actually disputed uh, Bettelheim's claims that it was due to poor parenting. He suggested more of a biological component being responsible for autism, specifically in the brainstem. His work actually supported a biological basis for autism, and actually kind of like disproved uh, Bettelheim's claims about it being uh, more of an environmental environmental factor due to the parenting of, of the mothers. Rimland's biological research showed that uh, autism was different in comparison to other childhood disorders, therefore supporting um, a biological reasons for why autism should have its own distinctive category. And then we move on to Lorna Wing and the current DSMs. So as we can see, the, the DSM-3 came out in the around 1980s, and it was the first one to actually um, have um, some, uh, to define autism. It had pervasive developmental disorder, childhood onset PDD, infantile autism, and atypical aut autism. And a lot of this work is due to, and a lot of this um, new definitions of autism is due to the work of Lorna Wing. Lorna Wing was a strong force behind this uh, new autism spectrum disorder. She actually helped translate Asperger's work, as I mentioned earlier, and helped it gain popularity within America in the 1980s. She argued that the de degree of severity for an autistic individual's characteristics varied, and that there were some individuals with autism who had no cognitive delays, which led her to conclude that some were higher functioning. She said that it's almost impossible to have this categorical system for individuals with autism because of the varying degrees of impairment, and therefore it was a pointless to have this categorical system. And as we can see, the dsm 3 r came out, it still had these categories, but it included PDD-NOS. And PDD-NOS was pretty much like a catch-all diagnosis for individuals who didn't meet criteria for all the other um, pervasive developmental disorders. So it was kind of, again, it was this catch-all to kind of like helping like uh, identify all these individuals with social impairments. And then in 1994, the DSM-4 came out, and under PDD, it had, again, PDD-NOS, autistic disorder, but it included actually Asperger's disorder, which is due to the work of Lorna Wing. And Asperger's disorder was pretty much like a way of saying high-functioning autism, because uh, it, it pretty much, Asperger's disorder was used to identify individuals with no language delay other than pragmatic skills who struggled with social skills and understanding social cues. And but again, this uh, DSM four still didn't have a wasn't on a spectrum. It still used categories to really identify individuals with social impairments. And then we see the DSM four uh, TR, which had a similar diagnosis with the DSM four, but some revisions to to PDD NOS. It was, however, the first one to drop autism and uh, and actually have autistic. Uh, d spectrum disorder. So it's the first one to actually acknowledge that these symptoms have them on the spectrum. However, they still use the categories such as Asperger's disorder, PDD, NOS, and to identify individuals who don't meet uh, autism spectrum disorder. And they started to use uh, Connor's triad of impairments, which, which includes social difficulties, communication problems, and repetitive and restrictive activities to describe ASD's core features, which are social relatedness, deficits, restrictive, repetitive, and stereotype behaviors, and communication deficits. And as we can see, there were some changes made in the uh, DSM-5, uh, which we currently see today. It mixed social relatedness with social interaction. But the biggest thing that DSM-5 was, it's really the first one to encompass a spectrum disorder. It got rid of all the other uh, pervasive developmental disorders, such as PDD, NOS, Asperger's disorder, Rett's disorder, and childhood disintegrative disorder, and has ASD under one neurodevelopmental disorder. And now that, as, you know, as mentioned before, it included the levels of severity, which we didn't see before. However, Lorna Wing and other psychologists still have some problems with the DSM-5. Lorna Wing believes that it fails to include important components such as social imagination, diagnosis of autism in infancy and adulthood, and it's more efficient when, with identifying men uh, than with autism as opposed to women. They, uh, some also believe that it might fail to uh, identify individuals that were once identified as having PDD NOS. However, recent research has kind of dismissed this point, saying that the DSM-5 has a good level of specific specificity in identifying individuals with autistic traits and symptoms, as well as sensitivity. 
So, as you can see, you know, there there was a lot of changes that happened all throughout the 1900s to kind of uh, explain uh, the history of autism spectrum disorder, but there are still some concerns. But given how, what we know about history, it's only a matter of time before we actually see some changes being made to this new version of the DSM-5, and we'll see what happens after that.